Okay, very quick story. Bear with me. Uh, this is Estonia, part of Eastern Europe, roughly the size of New Hampshire and Vermont combined. Estonia became part of the Soviet Union in World War II. They didn't get their independence till the Soviet Union collapsed 50 years later. And by the time Russian troops finally left Estonia in 1994, broadly speaking, Estonians were kind of psyched to see them go. In 2007, Estonia's parliament passed a forbidden structures law, which said anything that marks or celebrates those 50 bad Soviet occupation years is getting torn down. That could have included this giant, hideous, heroic Russian soldier statue that the Soviets left behind in Estonia's capital city. Uh, Russia and ethnic Russians who wanted that statue to stay got really mad about the prospect that the statue and other things representing the occupation were going to get torn down. There were riots. Ultimately, the Estonians decided they wouldn't tear down the giant hideous brass Russian soldier statue. They would just move it out of the city center. Russia was still furious. They love that statue. This means war. Now, if in your mind you're remembering Russian tanks lumbering into Estonia in 2007, uh, your memory is wrong. Uh, that's not what happened. That's not what they did. Instead, uh, Russia went to war uh, more like this. Estonia is one of the most wired countries in the world. Even years ago, they already had more mobile phones than people. Every school online, 90% of all bank transactions conducted online. People in the capital city pay their bus fare and their parking tickets by text message. They vote online. There's free internet access for everyone, basically, as a basic right. The country is called Estonia, but you can think of it as Estonia. They're really online. And that's what Russia went after. Or at least what it seems like Russia went after. Uh, distributed denial of service attacks, essentially millions of simultaneous online hits, shut down access to government websites and newspaper websites and other online media, then the telephone networks, the credit card verification systems, banking, even the basic indexing structure of the internet, all tied up in Estonia. And it went on for weeks, essentially a total shutdown. Now, the Russian government said they did not do it. But they said they couldn't rule out the possibility that patriotic individual Russians just did it on their own free time. The Russian government also said they weren't behind a similar but even more crippling attack on Internet and IT systems in the nation of Georgia the following year. Even before physical military fighting broke out, Georgians could not get access to information from their own government. They could not read online media. They couldn't call out of the country in some cases or send emails out of the country in some cases to let anybody else in the world know what was going on in that war. That's cyber war. Russians appear to be good at it. So do the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Israelis, lots of countries, maybe even us. Cyber war is such a 1970s style Tron sounding word <laughs> that we associate it with relatively harmless pranking of government websites, like what happened to the Georgian president's website during that war with Russia, or like happened to some U.S. government websites when we think North Koreans came after us last July. It starts to feel like much more than pranking when you think about all the other systems that are potentially vulnerable to attackers who have skills and points of access to take down not just websites, but email systems, banking systems, finance systems, phone systems, cell phone systems, electrical grids, municipal systems. This isn't the first time you've actually thought of this. Did you see the Italian job? Do you remember when they hacked into the, spot, uh, into the stop, stop lights? They are about to hit a major detour and be sent your way. <laughs> we believe that lovable rogues in baseball hats and our heist movies can take down critical infrastructure through hacking. Why do we have such a hard time believing the Chinese intelligence services might do it to us too? Joining us now is Richard Clark. He was the nation's first special advisor to the president for cybersecurity. He's also the government's former counterterrorism chief. He's now chairman of Good Harbor Consulting. His new book is called Cyber War, The Next Threat to National Security and What to Do About It. Richard Clark, thank you so much for being here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I read the book, and I'm sort of obsessed with the concepts in it, as you might be able to tell. I can see that. Um, that last Fourth of July attack. I remember it as affecting websites of like the FTC, Treasury Department. It's, it was sort of seen mostly as a nuisance. How bad could that have been? Well, the North Korean attack, and it was a North Korean attack, is interesting because there's nothing for us to attack back in retaliation. Hmm. They don't have cyberspace very much over there. In fact, they had to launch the attack from China. 
uh, and from South Korea. So they have North Korean operatives outside, physically outside of North Korea in places with better internet infrastructures from which they can launch attacks. Oh, absolutely. They had North Korean army people take over a whole floor of a hotel in China to launch part of this attack. So that's interesting. They can defend themselves because they don't have anything to defend in cyberspace. Mm. And even this poor little country can attack us. What they didn't do, they flooded us in various sites. What they didn't do was get inside those sites. But they could, or somebody else could. We know that countries can get inside the control systems for the things you mentioned, the electric power grid. So they turn off the lights? No, they don't just turn off the lights. They cause a generator to explode. That's hard to replace. It keeps the electric power grid down for a long time. They could cause trains to derail. So the United States government has created these military commands, the 10th Fleet, which has no ships, the 24th Air Force, which has no planes, U.S. Cyber Command, to do this sort of thing. China's created military commands. Russia's created military commands. So for me, there are two takeaways here. One, we better defend ourselves. And we're not doing that. Unfortunately, the Obama administration's attitude is, we'll defend the government, the rest of you are on your own. Mm. And the other takeaway here is we ought to talk about arms control. We ought to try to get this military uh, under control. We need some civilian oversight of this thing before it happens by accident. When you talk about our military cyber command, is it offense or defense or both? It it's sounds both. like it's... Okay. It's both. So it's about... Finding, finding ways to access other countries' vulnerabilities, not, uh, not accessible through physical warfare, but through uh, computing. Right. But it's also trying to protect the United States from similar no. attacks. It's trying to protect the Pentagon from similar attacks. It doesn't have the authority and it doesn't have the capability to defend you and me, to defend the banking system, to defend the power grid, trains, pipelines. No one's doing that. The government's policy is you defend yourself. It's as though in the Cold War, when the Russians had bombers that could come bomb us, mm -hmm. it's as though the government said to U.S. Steel in, in Pittsburgh, you know, the Russians have bombers. You better get some air defense systems to protect yourself from them. Because right. we don't want to interfere with your private industry. Uh... Right. It goes back to ideology, and it goes back to the, the dislike in Washington to regulation. I mean, the only way the government's going to be able to defend our cyberspace is to have more regulation. That regulation in Washington is a dirty word. But if we don't have some targeted regulation, we're not going to be able to defend ourselves against North Korea or Iran. If we do sanctions on Iran over their nuclear program and they choose to retaliate by a cyber attack and we're defenseless, you know, the day after, people are going to wake up and say, why couldn't we defend ourselves? Critical national systems that are not government systems are the sort of things that we've thought about in terms of traditional counterterrorism uh, measures. Things like chemical plant security, things okay. like the security of our ports, mm -hmm. other things that are not necessarily government functions but we recognize would be an attack on the American people. We've also been not very successful at making, those, making ourselves more resilient uh, in those senses because we've had to go through industry in order to try to get those things protected. Right. Same thing's happening here. Same thing's happening here. Regulation is a dirty word. Industries resist. We just had Verizon win a case in federal court, and the, and the federal judge ruled the government cannot regulate the Internet under existing law. Well, then the government cannot defend cyberspace under existing law. Is there a conflict between privacy concerns uh, on, on, on the Internet and the need to protect from our, our critical national systems from cyber attacks? Absolutely. Okay. Now, one simple way, and it would be a terrible idea, but one simple way to defend would be to have the government filtering, watching what's going on on the Internet. You know, after the Bush administration wireless, uh, wordless wiretapping with NSA, I don't think that's a very good idea. Yeah. I, I'm not going to be the guy who says trust the government. Yeah. But there's a way of doing it by making the telephone companies, making the Internet service providers filter what's going on on their networks. Can you filter for security but not for content? Yeah, you can. What you do is you look for patterns of ones and zeros that are known to be attack software. And you're not reading people's emails. But even then, I don't want the government doing it. Yeah. Let's have Verizon do it. Let's have AT&T do it. And let's have somebody else checking to make sure they're not abusing our privacy rights. One last question for you. 
Is this going to be another one of these post-Cold War things that's sort of defined both by asymmetry and anonymity, where, where, where countries, nation states are at a disadvantage and the real threats, the real agility, the real incentive to use attacks like this are for non-state terrorist groups and for lone wolves who are extremists. No, I know there's a theory out there that that's the case. I think this is about nation states. and That's, in fact, good news. Mm -hmm. Because if we get our act together, we can move from talking about cyber war to talking about cyber peace. I'd like us to be talking about cyber defense first. Well, that's part of cyber peace. Yeah. Uh, cyber war, the next threat to national security and what to do about it uh, is the new book by uh, Richard Clark. Uh, it's not only important, it's compelling and uh, written like a thriller, which is one of your particular skills, sir. Thank you so much for being here. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks Thank very you. much.